Hello everyone. Welcome to the second episode of Conversations About Color. I'm so excited to have you all joining us today. Um, a little bit about myself. My name is Dr. Uzma Sayed, for those who don't know me. I'm a first generation Indian Muslim American infectious disease physician based in New York. Hi, Faiza. Hi, Hijabi Diaries, Sumadin, IDSA Foundation is with us. Hi, everyone. So happy you can join us today. Um, feel free to um, send your comments or questions in the boxes. Um, we will try to get to everybody's questions as best as possible. A lot of the times we end up answering the questions during our conversation, um, but re really appreciate you being here with us today. And please um, feel free to send us a wave and a hello and, and as we go through this uh, important dialogue today. So a little bit more about myself. Uh, as I mentioned before, I'm an ID physician, so frequently I talk about infectious diseases. I talk about my journey and my path, and especially given that we are currently in the pandemic with this novel virus, I talk about that a lot, try to keep everybody up to date on the latest information. But I also have a lot of other passions. I'm very passionate about youth and mentorship, and I talk frequently about my 501c3 organization called Alinus. Um, I'm involved in interfaith activities. I do a lot of community activism, um, running for office, um, keeping everybody engaged and active and humanitarian work. Um, and obviously I am really passionate about food, fashion and travel. So you'll see that frequently on my uh, Instagram feed and uh, on my stories. But I'm really excited to have a very special guest um, today. Um, and so let's go ahead and get Stephen, uh, Mr. Stephen Peeler invited to our chat. And I can't wait for you all to really meet him and hear from him today. All right, he should be joining us shortly. Hello, Seema. Hi, Ruby. Hi, Nora, how are you? And here we go. Stephen is about to get on with us. Well, hello. Hello, Stephen, welcome. How are you, Uzma? Fine, thank you, how are you? Fantastic. I didn't know we were color coordinating today. <laughs> yes, look at that. Great I minds think alike. What can I say? <laughs> I love it. It's a beautiful day here in Maryland. I'm glad to be here. Oh, Thank I'm you for having me. So glad. So glad to hear that. It looks wonderful outside. Glad Great. you're getting some fresh air. <laughs> and vitamin D. Absolutely. Yes, much needed. Very good for our health and our immune system. So <laughs> good little plug there. So I'm really excited to have you with us today, and I want to just start off by telling everybody um, a little bit about you. Um, but first, I'm just going to do a brief, you know, introduction. Mm -hmm. sure. Stephen Peeler, who's with us, um, is a wonderful, highly accomplished individual. We're so excited to have him here with us today. He's the executive director of IDSA, and he's a certified fundraising executive. So Stephen, welcome to um, Conversation About Color, and thank you so much for giving us your time today. And I want to just start off, if you can just um, tell everybody a little bit about yourself and your background, we would love to hear about you. Well, sure. First, I have to say thank you for being a uh, donor and a supporter of the IDSA Foundation. I'm uh, appreciative of you and all of your support. And I, I would say that I started my background in association management and or fundraising uh, probably back in 95, 96. So I've been around for a little while, uh, and it was 1998 when I first uh, heard about IDSA. Uh, Sandy Harwood was one of my first clients as a national salesperson at the uh, Marriott National Accounts, mm -hmm. and uh, I was steering uh, uh, IDSA to all of the Marriott properties around the, the country. And uh, then it was uh, 2003 when I was reintroduced to, uh, or I, I met and became good friends with uh, Chris Buskey. And mm -hmm. I think that uh, for me, you know, my background growing up in the Washington, D.C. area, 
and uh, being a native Washingtonian, there aren't a lot yeah. of us around, but uh, I'm a Redskin fan, die hard as, as I am. <laughs> and uh, it's been challenging to be a sports fan, especially during this pandemic, but I've, I've enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's great. So that's, you know, wonderful segue right into our next topic that I would love to talk a little bit about your childhood. Um, so if you could yeah. tell us, you know, did you move around or did you stay? Have you been, uh, you know, essentially in the area your whole life? How was your childhood growing up? I have been pretty much in the Silver Spring, D.C. Met metro area. Uh, mm -hmm. When I joined Marriott, I moved out to Roanoke, Virginia. And then from Roanoke, okay. Virginia, I moved to Richmond, Virginia. And uh, then back up to D.C. And I, I think when I look back on those times, uh, it was always relationships and building relationships that uh, really propelled me in my, my growth. You know, when I look at, you know, going to school or learning different uh, networks to join and, and participate mm -hmm. in. It really always came back to people. Yeah, a lot of people say that they're people persons or, or yeah. a people person, but I, I think I've really uh, done that. And you know, for the most part, I have enjoyed the diversity in, of the metropolitan Washington area. I couldn't imagine too many other places to live. Absolutely. Well, that's wonderful to hear. So specifically in your childhood, I mean, it seems like you definitely are um, quite a people's person. And so it's obvious that, you know, you've developed these foundations from a very young age. Um, do you think your family upbringing had something to do with that? Um, you know, your dynamics in your household, um, you know, even your encounters, you know, during your childhood, you know, how were how were those different stages leading up to um, high school, college, and then, you know, the workforce? Yeah, great question. I think um, someone asked me about when I was re reflected uh, on diversity and when I first faced a challenge. And I would say it was the first day of kindergarten. I was a left-hander and I had a little name badge that said Stephen on it with a little deer and it said left-hander. So I knew that I was sitting over here because I needed to uh, be with the, the kids that were left-handed versus the right-handed. Wow. So I would say from a very, very early age, my father worked for the government, the defense department, and uh, mm -hmm. mom uh, gave me all my culture. She did not work, but uh, it worked with art and painting and what have you. Uh, so I think that, you know, from that early age of growing in Silver, growing up in Silver Spring, Maryland, pretty yeah. insulated for the most part. It was a majority um, uh, white community, if you will. Uh, and mm -hmm. then going into high school uh, for, um, we wanted to have a public school education with a little more diversity, moved out to Gaithersburg, Maryland, <clears throat> where my parents live today. And uh, it really was uh, uh, interesting. I think when I decided to go to Clarion State and then later Howard University, I, I was yearning for more diversity. I wanted to be mm -hmm. not just one of five in my high school class mm -hmm. and not you know just one of those kids. Um, because we had a very uh, stable middle class, like a typical middle class uh, neighborhood uh, growing yeah. up. But I really thought that there were there has to be more. And uh, between my sister and I, uh, there's just the two of us, we really started uh, as we grew, got older to realize our, our uh, passion for diversity, inclusion, as well as making a difference and how we could leave a legacy on other people. So then when I went into the workforce and uh, I started working, as I mentioned earlier, for Marriott, and then I went to work for nonprofits and associations, it really became clear to me that that's something that I needed to do. I needed to not only give back, I needed to pull up other people that uh, could follow in my footsteps. And uh, that's really been my life, lifelong passion ever since. That's amazing. Now, you spoke about how, you know, you were sort of a minority uh, from a very, you know, young age, you noticed at the, you know, young age of, you know, five or six, when you were in kindergarten, you immediately, unfortunately, were sort of categorized in a, in a different bucket, just based on your, you know, your uh, being left handed. 
Um, yeah. How did that make you feel? I mean, did you already feel going into the school um, that, you know, you already had something that was distinguishing you from others, you know, based on skin color. And then now you have this, you know, somebody's um, designating, you know, you in a separate bucket. And did that, is that something that you faced, you know, throughout your schooling um, where you felt like there were different challenges at different courses of your education? Yes and no. I, I would say I realized that I guess I didn't realize just like the kids today don't really see yeah. color as we saw yeah. color growing up in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. Um, I would say I didn't, it didn't hit me in the face until high school. And okay. when I went to Seneca Valley High School, I realized then uh, when I was of dating age and wanted to date someone from Churchill High School, and I realized uh, when their parents said, no, I'm sorry, our daughter won't be coming out you know, to, to go out with you to the movies. And it just really made me say, wow, why? I, and I didn't understand. And I guess because we had the quote unquote privileges of being in the you know middle class, but we had no yeah. ideas. We didn't. I didn't go to a private school. I wasn't at a, a super elite school, if you will. Uh, but I did realize it then, and then that's when I decided to really uh, find out more about you know my culture, my history, talking with my aunts and uncles and grandparents and. That's where I learned that my grandfather was the first public school music teacher in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, wow. graduating from Carnegie Mellon in 1928. So I'm like, man, wow. if I can imagine this uh, uh, segregation in the 60s, can you only imagine what it was in 1928 <laughs> right. at a, a school Absolutely. like that? Yeah. Absolutely. Wow, that's amazing. So if you take your experiences growing up, you and your sister, sounds like pretty much you had a very, um, you know, normal sort of childhood. And it really was in late adulthood that you started sort of, uh, you know, exploring your identity and getting in touch with that. Because for the most part, everything was, you know, there weren't really that many challenges, you know, uh, for the most part, um, which is a very fortunate thing. You know, that's what we always hope for is that society is accepting and that we all can live in harmony. Um, now, if you take your experiences and then translate that into how your um, child and how your son is um, going through his experiences. Have, have you noticed a stark difference between, you know, time and place? And I mean, you, it seems like you're pretty much geographically in the same region where you grew up. Um, and I don't know if there's, obviously there's differences, you know, uh, demographics change over time, different people come in, in and out of different communities. So I don't know if your current um, situation where your son has been growing up has been as diverse or less diverse from your upbringing and how has that, um, and ha how has that, uh, you know, encountered his experiences and how has that really affected him and his growth? Yeah, great, great question. Again, I think that um, we, as with all parents, we always want the best for our kids and we want them to have something better than we have. So uh, my wife, uh, Michelle, and I decided at that time that it was around the time of 9 11. Uh, Eric was born in 2002 and uh, He's a high school senior now. So uh, obviously, you know, graduation and everything is a lot different now than what I was uh, going through back in my day. But I would say that uh, we made a conscious decision to immerse him in what we thought was the real world. So we enrolled him in Capitol Hill Day School, which was on Capitol Hill. Because of 9-11, we didn't want him to be very far from us. We both worked downtown. And it was about 30 to 35 uh, percent uh, diverse people of color in his class. Very small school, uh, 25 people in each class going through from pre-K all the way through the eighth grade. Uh, and now he's in a, I would say, predominantly African-American high school, even though it is a independent school, a uh, Catholic school called DeMatha Catholic here in um, Highsville, Maryland. And, uh, you know, as we you know, saw him uh, evolve and grow, we really wanted him to have the experience of that we had of the uh, working with and being able to communicate articulately with the majority as well as uh, minority. Uh, he has grown up uh, in uh, Prince George's County where we live now, which is uh, predominantly African-American, and it is also a 
uh, county, which is which they say, I don't know, because I haven't seen the statistics, but they say it's the most uh, affluent African-American community in the country. Um, so I would still say that, you know, if we're talking about socioeconomic, it's still middle class. Uh, mm -hmm. But if I look at the 12 uh, homes on our cul-de-sac, you know, 10 of them are going mm -hmm. to independent or private schools. So it is a little different, right. obviously, uh, for that reason. Right. Okay, so, you know, that's really interesting. So. Um, very different, you know, experiences, obviously. Um, but have you noticed has, you know, at any point, obviously, you have your personal experiences, your wife had her experiences, and your son now, I believe you have just one son, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Um, he's had experiences growing up through his childhood, even though it seems like in his childhood, he had more diversity and more exposure to African American community and Black American community. Um, we still find that there is still prejudice and racism within and outside of our communities. Um, do you did you ever encounter that where it sort of you know opened your eyes to the fact that even though you may be in more of a diverse community, these challenges still exist? Is there oh, any absolutely. time that you notice? No, absolutely. I, I am concerned with him every time he leaves the house. I don't know about the majority families, but I assume that they are not having the, quote, conversation or talk with their uh, black boys or uh, their sons. Uh, you know, when the police pull you over, not if the police pull you over, but when the police pull you over, you put your hands on the dashboard, things like that. So we definitely had to make it a much more conscious conversation, just as my father uh, tried to shelter me as a, as a young African-American man. So, uh, yes, uh, we definitely see that the world today is a lot different. Uh, while he is able to drive, we're, we're concerned if he drives my car, which might be a luxury car versus his car, not, you know, being pulled over and things like that. So he has seen it. Uh, his uh, friends have been approached before. I wouldn't say in a threatening manner, but just question. Uh, I have seen it by being pulled over myself. Um, and it, it, the disparities, uh, just like in healthcare disparities, uh, are exist. They are real. And as we see in this world today, uh, and each of the past seven nights, uh, we're seeing the front and center uh, the major difference is uh, not only a race, but a culture and tolerance. Absolutely. Yeah. And how old was your son when you first had these conversations with him? Do you remember? Was there a specific point in time, oh, an yeah. encounter that happened where it sort of forced you to have this conversation? Or was it, uh, you know, a very, you know, specific, you know, goal that you had in mind that, you know, you, you had this thought that you and your wife were going to have this conversation by a certain age? Six years old. Uh, Eric uh, joined the Cub Scouts. Uh, Boy Scouts of America has uh, Cub Scouts for people, uh, boys that are under uh, 12 years old. And um, my wife became a den leader. And uh, we realized then it was time for him to understand that even though he was going to a multicultural school and it was a private school, that he had to understand that there are differences and people are going to look at you in a different way. And I think that because he was in our community um, going to the Cub Scouts, that's what made us say, we have to have the conversation with him sooner than later. Even though we, he didn't see it at school, he just saw himself as one of the other kids, mm -hmm. one of the right. other students. We realized that uh, whether he was knocking on doors, selling popcorn for the Boy Scouts as they do in the fall, uh, yeah. or if he was uh, going out camp at night, whose tent he could or could not get into, things like that, <coughs> were, was going to be a, a concern for us. So we made it uh, clear to him at that age wow. what he could and not, he could not do. Right. right. Such a young age where they, like you mentioned before, children don't really see color. Um, so I can only imagine what his, you know, uh, thought process was and how he responded to that. Do you remember what that conversation was like? <coughs> yeah, he, he, excuse me, he did not understand at all. And he just saw his friends as, you know, CC or Zaya or, you know, Susie Two-Shoes. He, he never saw that as color. 
uh, and because he was, we tried to isolate him, insulate him as much as possible from right. from that. Uh, but yeah, right. he definitely did not understand at the time. As he became older, then he started to understand uh, the culture and the diversity of the world. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, there was a, a tweet that went viral recently, um, even just, I think, in the last 24 hours, which really talked about what you mentioned just uh, a minute ago uh, about how, you know, there was a young a, a teenager, I think an 18 year old um, uh, boy, actually, that tweeted about what his the instructions his mother had given him uh, as a black American, um, especially black American male. Uh, uh, in America and things like a list of things that he must do every time. Some of these yeah. included, you know, things that we would never even think about or take for granted, the average person, um, right. such as, you know, things such as, you know, never leaving the store without a receipt, right. um, you know, never touching anything that you don't plan on buying. I mean, it, right. it was just, this list was just so disturbing. Um, and, you know, making sure that if you're, and it's not, it wasn't if you're pulled over, it, it said when you're pulled over, a series of events that you need to do, you know, put your hands mm -hmm. on the steering wheel, don't resist, you know, ask permission, you know, are these certain things that as your son was growing up and getting older that you had to have these difficult conversations with him as well? Absolutely. Uh, you know, being a basketball player, being now six foot seven, you know, he obviously graduate, um, gravitated towards sneakers. And, you know, mm -hmm. as we went into these sneaker shoe stores and he started looking at these $100, $200 shoes, we were then having a conversation about don't let anybody steal your shoes, don't flaunt right. the shoes, that kind of thing. But also, right. w just like you said, when you go into these stores, you know, let the people know that only try them on if you plan on buying them, you know, because... Uh, it was definitely one of these uh, situations where even today, when we travel around, um, people will follow us at a certain kind of store and what have you. And it's like, no, you can't have that kind of belt or, or XYZ brand because uh, people will look at you a certain way. And not to get hung up on the stereotypes of this brand versus that brand, but just to say, just because you can afford it doesn't mean that it's not going to draw attention. And you don't want to draw attention to the physical things or the materialistic things that you have, but really let people get impressed with your articulateness. My sister, as I mentioned before, is up in uh, Brooklyn, uh, New York, mm -hmm. and she's a political fundraiser, ironically. And, uh, <laughs> you know, so she has uh, quite a knack for, for speech and working on major campaigns in the New York area. And uh, both of us uh, with having African-American sons are very sensitive to how we uh, educate them, but also how we uh, school them on the things that they won't learn in school beyond just how to balance a checkbook <laughs> or things like that. Wow. That's amazing. And I can only imagine some of the challenges, you know, looking at it from a teenager's perspective, I'm sure you had a lot of resistance where your son or even, you know, your nephews or nieces, maybe they wanted to splurge and get those items where, you know, why can't I have it? My friends have it. You know, that's a very common sentiment mm -hmm. among kids, especially teenagers. And that must have been a very difficult time um, for you and your wife to really sort of drive home that message. Uh, but conversely, I also want to ask, did you, did you um, or your son, especially as a family, if you were ever shopping, did you have, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately deal with prejudice and, you know, and the and racism in the aspect where you were denied a certain product or you were denied, you know, access to something because, you know, it was assumed that you maybe did not have, you were not financially, you know, uh, stable to afford these things. Yes, did that I ever happen to you and your son? Absolutely. It happened to me. I'll start with me when I was in uh, Roanoke, Virginia. Uh, anyone who knows me knows I love uh, chocolate ice cream and, and having hot fudge sundaes. And I remember explicitly someone coming up to me and say, do you realize that three scoops of chocolate ice cream with uh, marshmallows and toppings is going to be $8? It's like, I didn't ask you how much it was. I just wow. said that that's what I wanted. And wow. then I remember, you know, going from Roanoke, Virginia to Richmond, Virginia, specifically. Uh, and I call that really a, a shoe leather town where you really have to meet people eyeball to eyeball. And they were not allowing me to join certain organizations or participate in a broader um, 
network of friends or business colleagues, so like uh, say a chamber of commerce or something like that. I wouldn't say mm -hmm. I was denied, but I uh, wouldn't open their arms to be inviting unless I joined a certain particular club. And even if I joined that private club at that time, then it was like, well, what are you doing here? And how are you paying for this? And all those kinds of questions uh, wow. behind the scenes. Together, uh, yes, we've traveled uh, internationally and we've, we've seen that as well as uh, domestically, uh, as far as no, you really shouldn't be here. But it's like, well, why, why not? And of course we just avoid that. And now we're really more social, socially conscious, you know, as we, we see different uh, CEOs of uh, companies that I won't name here, obviously, um, saying that, oh, I give to this campaign or that campaign that are against our um, values, family values, if you will, or our diversity and inclusion values, uh, inclusiveness values. And uh, we, we just don't go to those uh, particular companies anymore. Wow, that's, you know, I mean, it's a it's a tough thing to have to live through. Would you say that things have, I mean, in your experiences from, I don't know if you were close with your grandparents, um, or your parents, you know, with their, over the generations, how have you seen things shift over the course of years? You know, has, have things gotten better, worse? Has, has there been a fluctuation where things have seemed, you know, because it seems like in your childhood, which a lot of times, you know, we're sort of naive in our childhood and as we're, we're growing, we don't really see all of the injustices or, or things that may be happening that our parents can see from their eyes. Um, but as you grew throughout your experiences, have you noticed, was there a big pendulum? Um, you know, have things gone up and down or have you felt like things have been essentially static? No, I think things are getting better for the most part. Uh, I remember in 1979, uh, 79, 80, in junior high school, my father and I used to run. He was a marathoner, and I got into track and cross country. And he and I would run down the streets in Gatesburg, Maryland, and we would be spit at and uh, cursed at uh, out the window as we were running five, six miles around our neighborhood. I mean, the neighborhood we lived in. Uh, today, we you know travel to Martha's Vineyard, for instance, as a family, an extended family with my sister and her family. Um, and we rent very beautiful homes. Uh, and uh, I, I wouldn't say that anyone is asking us, well, how are you affording that kind of a house? It's only for one week. And that's more than people pay for their, their house or their mm -hmm. mortgage for you know, a particular year. But uh, it definitely is something in the back of our minds, uh, but it's getting a lot better because we don't see that as much um, because of the, the people we surround ourselves with. And I would say, again, going back to being much more insular, you know, our mm -hmm. friends are of the same social economic class as, mm -hmm. as his friends, et cetera. So uh, ironically, he's in Gaithersburg tonight visiting one of his friends. And it's like, That's wow, great. you know, it's a lot different than when I was going up in Gaithersburg. Yeah. Right. Wow, that's great. So you were telling us um, before that your son is getting ready for college. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So he just graduated. <laughs> I mean, it's a tough, the, he's tough time right, right now with coronavirus yeah. and, you know, everything sort of being in limbo. Um, but, you know, maybe you can share with us, you know, your experiences in college. And um, obviously, there's been a lot in your life that has defined you. And now as he's getting ready for college and given the current, you know, climate in the country, what kinds of conversations have you been having? Um, and what are things that, you know, worry you? And what are things that are you, you are optimistic about? Yeah, I, I think the, the future is bright for the young people today. You know, I really think that their success and their hard work will define, you know, their growth and their, their path, whether it's a career or what have you and the people that they have access to will and that they network with will help them move to that next, that whole next level. So I would say that, you know, from when I was in school, <laughs> social distancing, sorry. Uh, so when he, you know, as he's graduating from high school and he's having a virtual graduation on Friday, you know, it's a whole lot different from when I was, you know, obviously going to school. And I think that um, it, the culture today and the climate today 
is still very challenging, but because we're more in the suburbs uh, versus downtown, seeing the marchers walk in front of our street and what have you, it, it's definitely a, a different climate. So I would say that um, he has a much brighter uh, future from that perspective, but we definitely had that conversation with him again, saying, when we went to school, we were able to do X, Y, Z. When you go to school, yeah, you might be thinking of partying, what have you, but underage drinking and, and things like that, you've got to be careful because, you know, just, you know, saying that you're innocent and having your hands behind your back for nine minutes laying on the ground is not going to be a pass for getting out of that situation. So don't put yourself in that situation, you know, as you move forward. So it's, it's definitely a different conversation that we're having. Uh, stay awake, woke, what, whatever, you know, people are saying today. Yeah. But it definitely makes us very nervous, you know, uh, and we have encouraged him to have an open conversation with us about anything he feels uncomfortable with, anything that he sees that is uh, out of the norm or, or, or doesn't feel feel right and to to let us know or his network of family and friends know so that he understands he has us as a backstop that's amazing um given that you know you are in the center of you know obviously uh, essentially the entire nation is is uh, dealing with all the turmoil and the protests and everything that are going on um, has your son spoken to you? Um, ha, you know, have you had conversations, obviously, about what's happening? And you know, does he um, does he have any desire to participate? Does he have any concerns, you know, about his future? You know, what are the kinds of things that are going through in your household, you know, immediate household, and and what are the things that you have been reflecting on? Yeah, uh, great question. He. He definitely has come up to us, shown us videos. Can you believe this just happened? Did you see this in this particular city or state? Um, he's, he's paying attention. Uh, I wouldn't say it's to the point where he's nervous or afraid, um, but I know that collectively as a family, we're not sleeping as deeply and soundly as we used to, even if you have an alarm on the house or what have you. Uh, so, yeah, he has definitely brought it to our attention in terms of, I don't know if it's just the viral videos, but I really think it's just, should we go down there? Should we not? If we do go down there, the people yesterday in D.C. were peaceful protesters, Dad, and they just pushed them out with these flashbangs yeah. and tear gas. So right. they weren't doing anything wrong, you know, and, um, you know, letting them know you can't be out after a certain time because of curfew. And this is what a curfew means. I mean, obviously, we have a family curfew, you know, be home by X, Y, Z time. But uh, right. no, he, he definitely is concerned. And he's always been a very compassionate person. So as a family, mm -hmm. my wife's job, uh, they're talking, really pushing her to say, okay, we have to open up. The, the city is opening up. We need to bring people back to work. And uh, specifically in her case, it's one week uh, per employee. So employees A would go the first week of uh, June. Employees B would go the second week of June, et cetera. As IDSA employees and foundation uh, staff, we're like, no. The last thing we want to do is catch an infectious disease and say, oh, yeah, we didn't follow our own guidelines or, or distancing, et cetera. So we're like, let's make sure we have the infrastructure in place that we can work from home uh, as long as we need to until people either feel comfortable or, um, you know, business necessitates that we go back. But we have since the Wednesday before the, uh, the city or country closed, uh, we've been mm -hmm. working remotely. Uh, to try and keep up our, with our continuity of work. Yeah, it's, you know, 2020 has been quite challenging on so many fronts, you know, in a way we are dealing with multiple pandemics uh, of, of all sorts. You know, we've got the pandemic with the novel, you know, coronavirus, you've got the pandemic with the misinformation that's been spreading about the virus. Then you've got the pandemic of racism and, you know, the list just keeps growing. And, you know, it's really, such a challenging time uh, for so many people, and especially African Americans, um, you know, who are being unfortunately, and Black Americans who are being affected disproportionately in every which way. 
Um, you know, how do you think co we collectively as a community can overcome some of these challenges? Vote. <laughs> I would say vote. <laughs> that is the number one That's thing. True. You know, people don't realize, and I didn't even realize until uh, I guess a young man got killed down, jogging down the street in South Carolina that they didn't have, or Georgia, didn't have a hate crimes law in the state. I assumed that every state had that, you know, right. and it's like, right. no, they, you, you can't do that. So I think that, you know, voting and participating in uh, the process, if you will, state, local, school boards, et cetera, will help us all, you know, get through this. But right now is just like right in front of our face. We have got to do something. And uh, protesting makes sense. I'm not against protesting. Um, you know, knock on wood, I've been working pretty full time and I haven't had time <laughs> to go down and protest uh, before curfews and things like that. Uh, but, you know, it's it's a very, very difficult time. It's just like you said, with the, the pandemic and now with 40 million Americans unemployed, a lot of my friends from Marriott and the hotel business and community in the past uh, that I worked with are unemployed on furlough indefinitely, et cetera. And it's like so painful just to see that. I just feel so, so, so sad for all of them. It is really a challenging time in so many different aspects. You know, it's it's something that's definitely going down in history. Um, and you brought up a fantastic point about voting. And I think, you know, people need to remember that, you know, we do have power. You know, we are very lucky, um, you know, in so many ways living in a democracy where, you know, and, and we should exercise that right. You know, it's so, so important. I think you really hit the nail on the head by saying that every, you know, election matters. It's not just the national election, but you have to start locally because, you know, there are people in power at every level. And if you don't agree with what's happening, you have the power to make bring about change. Um, and I think that's really, really important that that's one avenue and one way of really um, making significant change uh, by either being, you know, exercising your right to vote or being part of the establishment, being part of this, uh, the system to really bring about you know, um, consciously bring about positive change. Um, so I wanted to ask just a last few questions before we let you go. Um, you know, given that, you know, you, uh, your, you know, you and your wife and your entire family seems to be um, rather well, uh, you know, acclimated and, um, and, you know, seems like, you know, you're literature buffs. Um, are there any specific resources that you would recommend uh, specifically for adults or for children that, you know, um, can, you know, really turn to? Um, is there anything that you recommend? Yeah, selfishly, of course, I'll, I'll uh, recommend people reach out to IDSA, uh, idsociety.org uh, for uh, guidelines and, and guidance in what to do, et cetera. Uh, you can reach out to our IDSA Foundation website. But, you know, for I would say just participate, listen. Don't participate too much on the news because – it can get depressing. It really could be uh, detrimental to you. Uh, but I would say, you know, look at scientists. You know, obviously everyone uh, today knows who Dr. Fauci is. He's one of our members. He's a donor to the society and the foundation. Uh, we appreciate him. But pay attention to the scientists. You know, it's sort of like the news. I, I, I try not to get into the political news. So I listen to like Democracy Now! or some of the other stations like PBS that are more, much more neutral. Try and listen to that. So that way you get a global, global perspective as well as uh, just uh, national perspective because it, it's not just us. I mean, this whole um, uh, race challenge that we're dealing with right now uh, with the, the killings and, and the deaths is uh, front and center. And that was the only thing that could really push COVID out of the way. But 105, 106,000 of our Americans, you know, in 12, 13 short weeks, um, it's unbelievable. So yeah, definitely pay attention to science. and <laughs> Wear your masks, please, people. I, I'm just thinking of all these protesters that are out there. I can only imagine the COVID cases that are going to, you know, grow as a result of all this protesting. I like the protesting, but 
be careful, be safe. I think those are some excellent points that you just brought up. I think that's been one of the challenges with this pandemic and why, unfortunately, there's been, you know, so much misinformation, um, you know, that's been occurring. And I think a lot of that comes from this um, constant, you know, sort of, um, you know, um, conflict of information between uh, people, you know, science, uh, leaders in science um, and leaders in government. And unfortunately it leads to, first of all, we're dealing with a novel virus that, you know, we are still learning so much about. So the information does change. Um, and that in itself gives people a lot of anxiety and a lot of mistrust. But then when you have leaders in science and leaders in government, you know, conflicting each other, that leads to more mistrust. And so unfortunately, it's the general public then that becomes most vulnerable. They are so vulnerable to the virus. All of us are because we are none of us are immune to it. Um, right. But then, you know, people sort of forget that, you know, we, the virus is still there. It's still very much around us. And we have to find ways to do things safely, you know, find ways to protest safely, you know, continue mm -hmm. to wear the mask, continue the physical distancing, continue with the hand washing, and continue to stay home if you're not feeling well. So all of these things, you know, we are still dealing with the challenge of the pandemic. And I think people do need to keep that uh, in the back of their minds so that, you know, we can continue to, you know, advocate and get through these challenging times, but in safely uh, as a way as possible, given that, as you mentioned, over 100,000 deaths already and, you know, climbing. And, you know, we have to protect, you know, people's health, you know, at the end of the day. So, but it's really important um, to be educated, as you said. So I always say, you know, challenge the source, wherever you're getting the information, mm -hmm. make sure that it's accurate information, because as you know, on the internet and on social media, it's so easy to put anything out there. And it's, that's how misinformation spreads. You know? it, exactly. I, I was telling a, a coworker today on a, a, a Zoom call, uh, how proud I am of all of the women, for instance, that are now leading ID divisions and hospitals around the country. And, you know, whatever we could do to uplift them, but also inform facts and inform science for decisions, you know. So, you know, when I look look at the, the future of uh, infectious diseases, it's everything I can do personally and professionally to help prevent the next pandemic. Uh, it's coming, uh, whether they're talking about a summer surge or a fall surge, uh, it's, uh, we have to inform ourselves, just like you said, with validated sources and know that even if a organization uh, is being stifled currently, then we still have to go around and seek information from other credible sources. Absolutely. So Stephen, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. And I just want to ask you if there's any last, you know, message that you'd like people to really hear from you, anything that is really important that, you know, you want to leave people with, please, I'd like you to share, you know, your final thoughts with everyone. Sure. I would just say, uh, everyone be safe out there. Uh, I would say that uh, if you are in an opportunity to hire a person of color, a underrepresented um, audience or demographic, uh, please do that. Uh, give back, give plenty until it hurts, and then see what you can do to uplift the next generation. So whether it's my son or your son or your children or grandchildren, try and leave this country in a better place than uh, we were given it. And uh, I think if we live by that and treat others kindly and, uh, and nicely, we'll, we'll, be all, we'll all be fine. So that's it. Beautifully said. Thank you so much again, Stephen, for joining us. No, we hope you have a wonderful me. day. Uh, thank, thank you for you. having me. Have a, have a great evening. evening. All right. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.